Thank you, Dr. Burke. That was fascinating. I'd like to give you the coveted mm. cafe side mug for right. a, a muggy night in your future. <laughs> and uh, we'll you. take your questions at the mics uh, here and here. We'll start right there. Oops, excuse me. Okay. So this is a great question, and to me it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, so there is some scientific evidence uh, on these questions. So, so people who study paleoclimate, so sort of longer term, if you will, deep history or, or climate looking way far back, sort of understand, uh, you know, a lot of them are, are digging around in the mud almost literally and trying to reconstruct what was going on with the climate. And, and so the, the first answer to your question is, the temperatures were probably pretty similar in these places. At least, you know, the Indus Valley was was hotter than you know it was if you if you go a couple hundred miles north or whatever. Um, the Nile was certainly much hotter than Northern Europe. Um, but the second part of your question is, is harder to answer, and, and something we don't know entirely. But what studies suggest, and and actually what I didn't show you, but but what we did look in this in this uh, in this conflict paper, which which was in Science about a year ago. We put together all the data we could find on sort of the, the long-term, very deep history, the, the response of civilizations to changes in climate. And what you see there is something very similar. We have always had, no matter whether you look in the last 50 years in the U.S. or you look back to 4000 B.C. to, to what we think of as the world's first empire, so the Akkadians in modern-day Syria. So the Akkadians collapsed pretty dramatically around 2000 B.C. And this was correlated with this monumental drought in, in, in the Fertile Crescent, right? not unlike what's sort of playing out today in Syria. So in these studies, we don't have a lot of evidence that, that you would want to be able to really understand what was going on, but this, this sort of phenomenon where these, these large civilizations collapse due to changes in climate, we see over and over in the historical record. The Akkadians, the Mayans, um, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, um, so over and over. Um, it's, it's, I think, a fascinating question. It's a harder thing to study. The second question I have is about your corn uh, experiment. Um, maize. Um, <laughs> maize, yeah. corn, whatever. Yeah. Cor I corn. grew up on a farm in Michigan, so we called corn, it please. corn. Yeah. corn <laughs> anyway, was this Roundup corn or was it uh, <laughs> corn that was acclimated to the particular climate? Because yeah. I can imagine in plant genetics that different plant strains are going to do better in certain climates. And that's one of the reasons why we should have some diversity within our seed banks and so on. Yep. And uh, that's right. very important, I think. I agree. I agree entirely. Um, luckily, the seed banks, so we work with some of the seed bank folks, and they've built this, this vault in the Norwegian tundra to hold, hopefully, our world seed supply. Although, you know, with eight or 10 degrees Celsius warming, who knows, it might thaw. Uh, your question on, on, uh, on, on seed varieties. So what we could do in the US is we can look way back to before uh, sort of Roundup, you know, if, if you're worried about uh, these certain varieties, uh, GMO varieties or whatever, responding differently, we can actually uh, restrict our data to, to sort of before those varieties were released. And we see a very similar relationship between changes in temperature uh, and, and how corn responded. So it's not just corn. We see the same thing for soybeans. We see the same thing for wheat. So, um, so most crops, most row crops in the U.S. anyway, don't do that well when it's hot. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. It seems to me that in part your analysis um, sort of takes temperature 
and sees how people react to it. Um, it seems to me that uh, we are likely to be more bedeviled by temperature, by much more serious problems, such as uh, what will probably seems to be happening in California, which provides so much agriculture and food uh, for not only this country, but the rest of the world. It seems to me when you add to the effect that you talk about, the effect of perhaps uh, famine and uh, maybe sea level going up and displacing tens of millions of, well, millions of people, hundreds of thousands, say in Bangladesh. So it seems to me that that's on top of what you've been talking about. And that's even considerably more gloomy. <laughs> Uh, th yeah, that's right. So, so, so this is a great point. So things like sea level rise, so it, things that have not changed historically but might change dramatically in the future, things like sea level rise, are not going to be incorporated very well in the sort of research design that I showed you. So this is, this is a great point. But most of these things like sea level rise we think of as, as a negative thing in general. So if anything, that means our estimates are going to be underestimates of the potential losses. Absolutely. Maybe exponentially. We don't quite know what the function looks like, but no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think all evidence would suggest that our estimates would be conservative. So then it's even more surprising that our estimates are that much more negative than what's in the IPCC, right? Because, like you say, we, we're underestimating what could happen. But I, yeah, your point's exactly right. Thank you. It was a great talk. A couple of anomalies caught my eye, and they may not be important, but they've triggered something in me. Um, in countries in this, virtually the same latitude in northern Africa, Morocco and Tunisia, <clears throat> they're pink. But the other countries to the east are all a darker color. And similarly, in um, Central America and northwestern South America, <clears throat> you've got Panama, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua, and they're red. Mm -hmm. But yet you have... Uh, Colombia and Ecuador, and they're pink, and they're further south, and one would think that they would be hotter. So is something going on there? Did we mess up? <laughs> oh. um, so, so what these are, these are uh, population-weighted average temperatures. So if you go to a place like Ecuador, you know, Quito is pretty high, uh, and so the average temperature in Quito is going be, to be much lower than it is in San Jose, Costa Rica. Same thing in Bogota. Bogota is pretty high. So the, the capital cities where a lot of these people live are actually slightly cooler than if you average across all the Colombian jungles and the Ecuadorian jungles, which if you do that, I think you're absolutely right. You should see the same response function, the same average temperature that you would in, in Costa Rica. It's just that we're focusing on the temperature where the people are, and it, I think in, in the specific countries you mentioned, it's actually slightly cooler in the capital cities. Uh, I didn't hear anything about uh, what I call adaptation. I mean, people are pretty flexible, and uh, when, especially in something like that, which is a long, tra a long, long term uh, motion, I think that people will adapt to it. Yeah, so that's a great comment. Um, absolutely, people will adapt, and the empirical question is how much, right? Uh, so as scientists, this is actually something that, that's very hard to study, right? Because we don't have a great analog of future climate change, right? The whole, the whole worry about climate change is that it's just so far beyond our historical experience, right? So it's really hard to come up with uh, uh, a way just using historical data to, to, to measure how much people might adapt in the, in the face of climate changes this large. Um, so I agree with you, people will likely adapt. What our estimates would be, uh, would, would suggest would, would be if people respond to changes in future changes in climate as they have to past changes in climate, how might the, the effects change, right? And then you can then build into these sort of estimates any assumption you want to about adaptation. So maybe adaptation will wipe away half of the effect, right? So if it wipes away half the effect, then global losses are 20% instead of 40%. Um, you know, that's, it, that's sort of the best we can do here, right? Uh, you know, you, you can try to tease out adaptation a little more from the, from the historical data, but, but it's a really hard thing to do. So I completely take your question. Um, and, and it's sort of a, an open academic question, I would say, and an open policy question about how much, sort of, how large these adaptation magnitudes might be. But it's, yeah, it, it's a great point. Um, as you said, your uh, um, statistics came kind of from one-off years when uh, 
the temperature was hotter when we had a kind of a consistent climate. As the temperature keeps rising a little bit each year and the, and the soil dries out more and the snowpack, uh, these things are all going to be magnified, aren't they? Or did you consider that or is this... Uh, um, uh, so, so we can consider that in, in some studies. So the, the global estimates I showed you sort of ignored the effects of precipitation for the most part. Um, so one, th there is a, a, a good but not great, <coughs> excuse me, reason to do that. Um, in a bunch of cases, the outcomes do seem to be driven primarily by, by temperature and really hot temperatures. So it turns out in, in lots of parts of the world, as we've seen in California, hot temperatures are also associated with low rainfall. Um, so just looking at temperature actually picks up some of the effects of rainfall, but there could be this important sort of interaction going forward. So the global estimates I showed you did not build in those interactions. So if you think those interactions are negative, then again, our estimates should be sort of conservative. The agricultural study I showed you, where we have tons of data in the U.S. to sort of study, okay, so what if you get a really, really dry year and a really hot year versus a hot year and sort of a normal precipitation year, you can sort of tease apart these effects. Um, in the U.S., for agriculture, again, it, it's mostly driven by, by heat. It seems to be mostly driven by heat. Um, that's not to say going forward that that sort of dynamic could change. But as best we can tell, this sort of average temperature gives us a lot of information about sort of all the stuff that's going on. Hi. What can you tell us about geoengineering? Uh, this last Sunday and Monday, I mean, the chemtrails yeah. over the peninsula are really apparent. So obviously somebody's trying to change the climate. So I'm just wondering if you know anything about this. I, sure. So the question was about geoengineering. So if folks aren't familiar with that, these are, uh, it, it's sort of a blanket term for a range of efforts, as sort of a different way to control the climate. So let's say the policy negotiations fail, and, and can we come up with a technical solution? So what the sort of one people have thought about for a long time is uh, mirrors sort of the, the contrails. So we want to mimic a volcano, right? We want to pump sulfate aerosols up into the stratosphere, right, that's going to block some of the, the sunlight coming in. Um, I don't know. This, <laughs> on the one hand, it seems like a crazy thing, right? Uh, and it seems like not the way we want to go uh, if we can get a, a, any kind of policy solution. But in the absence of, of a policy solution, we need to study these things. We need to understand whether they will work, what sort of costs and benefits they're going to have. Um, so my sense is uh, blanket opposition to geoengineering is not what we want. I think we want opposition to it, but, but, or, or at least uh, thoughtful opposition to it, but, but to allow uh, governments and scientists to, to run the small-scale experiments that we need to understand how this is going to work and whether it would even work and, and what the sort of downsides might be. Because right now we have so little science on, on, on these large geoengineering questions. So I hope that it never comes to geoengineering, but I, you know, at this point, given the sort of the political climate, I, I don't think we can rule it out. But specific, I don't know if someone was doing something specific in the Bay Area last weekend. <laughs> I, I hope not. Hopefully it was just planes, but yeah. Um, in thinking of your May study, did <clears throat> you also uh, compare or study livestock, the effect on livestock and sea life as well? And what percentage was that? Uh, great question. So uh, we have very, actually very little evidence on livestock, unfortunately, uh, and, and maybe less on fisheries. So this is a very understudied area. Uh, as best we can tell, sort of there's a, there's a physiological response uh, for different types of livestock to hot temperatures. Um, so we know they, they sort of feed less well at really hot temperatures. So, um, you know, cattle productivity sort of goes down. The magnitude of the effects, though, I, I think we don't know very well. So I'm with you. It's an important question, one we unfortunately don't know much about. So going back to the IPCC studies that showed limited economic impact, I understand a lot of that can be traced to uh, a single economist named Richard Toll, who did some interpretations. And you've been really diplomatic so far, but I uh, <laughs> wondered if you're interested in being a little bit less diplomatic. <laughs> and then secondly, is your work going to get incorporated into the next IPCC uh, working group report? Uh, so I'll start with question number two. I certainly hope so. Um, I, and I, you know, we're, we're definitely hopeful that it will. And, and there's, some, there, you know, there's some other approaches that are a little bit similar to ours that yield sort of similar results. So we're, we're hopeful that this sort of approach will be incorporated. Uh, Richard Toll, um, I'm not sure I want to go there uh, since this will be on YouTube. I've gotten into Twitter battles with Richard Toll that have not gone well. Um, yeah, you know, uh, 
uh, on the one hand, so, so Richard Toll is an economist who studies the impacts of climate change. He, he runs a climate uh, or a sort of an economic model that helps us understand these impacts. Um, his views on this, I think, are, are not always necessarily in the mainstream, and, and our results would, would disagree, I think, pretty strongly with this. So we're actually working with one of Richard's main co-authors, um, so hopefully trying to build some bridges. But, you know, I don't know Richard personally. I only know him through Twitter, and that hasn't gone well. In reading about climate change, I came across an interesting statement, which possibly you can reconcile. Apparently, at the North Pole, the ice pack is contracting. At the South Pole, it's expanding. And I was uh, not quite sure how or why, and perhaps you've got an explanation, if there is one. Uh, th that's a great question. So the, the first part of, of what you said I know to be true. So definitely we've seen a, a, a sort of dramatic reduction in, in sea ice uh, in the Arctic. Uh, in Antarctic, I'm actually not sure. Um, so, I, you know, I'd be happy to, to look it up, but I, instead of guessing, I'm going to punt and say I, I don't know. Yeah, Rob would know. I, I think he said that the Antarctic sea ice was expanding, but... But the volume of it was much thinner. So maybe there's a reduction in total volume of ice. Yeah, like I said, I'm an economist. So when it comes to real climate science questions, I have to just wave my hand. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, if uh, Germany is going to be, what, 40, their, their economy by, it's going to increase 40% yeah. for, uh, and everybody else is tanking. Well, um, who is Germany going to be selling their stuff to? <laughs> No, it, it's a great question. Uh, right now, they sell most of their stuff to, to trading partners in the EU, uh, and our results would suggest that the EU is going to do all right. You know, So to the extent that they trade with the guys around them, they're going to be all right. Uh, the second question is, ha have you tried out your data on some uh, political climate deniers to see how um, effective it is? Um, <laughs> We, we have not yet. So these global results I showed you are, are sort of brand new. Um, so, so we have not tried it. I, I'm guessing it might not go well. Some of these guys uh, have made up their minds. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we'll do our best. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, Dr. Muller from Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, and the Berkeley Earth Summit. I think it was one of the first large-scale studies of temperature data. And um, he concluded that the Earth in, was indeed warming. Um, but furthermore, um, he said there were zones of the Earth which were getting colder while there were more zones getting warmer. And I think that he identified those because that's the data he had. Um, have you factored any of that into these locations which statistically are getting colder? And inter interestingly enough, his result saying um, global warming was real was covered on the front page of the Wall Street Journal yep. back then. <clears throat> and, and the reason it was covered w was because he was a longtime climate denier, right? So he was actually funded by the Koch brothers to do this story, which they thought, or do this study, which they thought was going to, you know, be a triumph of climate denialism. And to his credit, right, he did the science really well. He dug deep down into each sort of weather station around the world, put together probably, as you say, the most comprehensive data set we have, data and, and drew the conclusion that the data told them, which on average places are warming up, just as, as climate science would suggest. So to me, it's, it's a triumph of science, and I, you know, it's, it's great that he was such a good scientist. So, but what the, the second thing you said is also right. So it turns out, uh, if you just look over the last couple decades, some places have warmed up a bunch, and some places have actually cooled a little bit. So if you look over the U.S. Midwest, it turned, like our main corn growing area, so Iowa has not warmed up at all over the last two decades, or three decades. It's actually cooled a tiny bit, right? So this has been great for agricultural productivity in the U.S., and, agri and productivity would have been much lower had it actually warmed up a bunch, right? So, but that does not mean that it's not going to warm up in the future, right? Um, all of the climate models and the best data we have, again, suggest that over the long term, these places are going to warm up as well. The reason that they're cooling has to do with sort of more local scale or regional scale climate variability. Um, this stuff's still going to be bumping around over time, right? Uh, you know. Places won't always get warmer just in lockstep every year. Some places will flatten out. 
Um, but on average, we should expect even the places that haven't warmed or that have gotten a little bit cooler in the last few decades to, to warm up in the future. That's sort of the, as best we know. Um, I just wanted to respond to your earlier comment about geoengineering. Okay. The NRC recently released a report. They're preferring the language climate intervention because it's hard to engineer a system that you don't understand how it works. And one of the things that shocked me when I was hearing their summary was a group of scientists were recommending against research. And what they were specifically saying is that um, there are parts of the climate system, like humans creating clouds, that it's very important to understand how humans are already impacting the climate system. And since um, increasing reflectivity through creating more clouds is one thing that might be done in the future. Clouds pass away in a couple of weeks if you mess up. So they were saying there were a few little things that you might want to research, but there was a blanket, like, don't even research it recommendation coming from the NRC. Yes, so you do see that. Um, I, I think part of the motivation there is, is, is uh, interest in not disrupting the sort of policy debate around it, right? So some people are worried that if we open the door to, it, to, to even researching geoengineering, then we've allowed that to be an option, and people might be then less interested in coming to a political solution on geoengineering. You know, that, I don't know. That, that argument sounds, sounds maybe plausible to me. Um, the sorts of experiments we can do, like you say, I think there is some sort of low-hanging fruit. There are some small experiments we could do. We could, you know, so there are different proposals. One is you pump stuff up into the air. Another thing is you, you sort of fertilize the oceans, right? So people are actually doing these experiments right now, right? Um, so... You know, I, I think on balance, we, we just need to know more about the science and know if, if this is even an option. But, you know, I, I do understand the worry that if we go down this road, it, it, it could make the sort of political, um, the political scene harder. Just to study that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's the place to start. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, back to ancient civilization right. and what it has to do with today, perhaps. I suspect that most of those ancient civilizations had irrigation. And one of the issues with irrigation is you have to use quite a bit of water to flush the salt out. And the higher the temperature, the more evaporation, the more the salt accumulation, and so on. Now, right now in California, the, the farmers in the Central Valley want more water and they don't want it to go out through the Golden Gate. Right. Well, if you don't flush fresh water through the Golden Gate, salt water is going to come into the delta, right? And you're going to have real problems. Now, I have a friend in Basra, Iraq, and he says the Shah El Arab, where the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers come together, is already brackish in Basra. That's their drinking water source. And if you think about the fact that about 40% of the people on Earth depend on the fresh water from the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, if those glaciers, I guess they're called the third pole, some people sure. call them. Yeah. About 40% of the uh, people on Earth are going to suffer. In a place like Bangladesh, is not going to have enough fresh water to flush out the salt water from the Bay of Bengal. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's just, to me, kind of terrifying. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, to me as well. So the, the salinization problem is exactly, I, I think, right, and is already a big problem in, in many parts of the world. So. Um, the other way to look at irrigation, though, is if you do have access to some irrigation water, it actually reduces a little bit the effects of temperature. Part of the effect of temperature on agriculture is by stressing plants out and making them use more water, right? So if you have some irrigation water, so imagine a world in which the temperature goes up a bunch, but the rainfall doesn't change that much, which is sort of, on average, what the climate models tell you, right? So in a world then with a little bit of irrigation, uh, it's actually likely that the temperature effect the negative temperature effect on crops will be a little bit smaller because irrigation actually helps you. The salinization problem, I agree, is, is a hard problem. It's, it's a hard problem in India. It's a hard problem in the, in the Middle East. Uh, it's, it's a difficult problem. Well, my farmer friends in Michigan say they don't believe in irrigation when it's really hot because you just get ir 
All you're doing is pumping water, which costs money, out of the aquifer, and you're not gaining that much in terms of productivity. So uh, there is that argument too. Sure, uh, there, there's probably a trade-off if it gets really hot, but I think most of the evidence suggests that, that there, there is a benefit under hot temperatures of, of a little bit of irrigation. But you're right, you know, you can pump a bunch of water and, and lose a lot of it to evaporation, especially, you know, in these really, really hot climates. But it's a good point. Uh, back to uh, gloom and, and doom, okay. Glo gloom at least, and I think the answer may have been in the Al Gore um, movie, but sh were we to uh, stop combusting um, hydrocarbons today completely, uh, we already have a, a huge amount of tonnage in, of CO2 in the atmosphere. What would the temperature be that we peak out at, and when would that happen? Yeah, it's a great question. So. Um, if we stop emitting today, like you say, the temperature will keep rising. And the reason that happens, <clears throat> excuse me, is that uh, CO2 sticks around for a lot in the, sticks, sticks around for a while in the atmosphere. So usually 10 to 20 years, I think is the estimate, maybe longer. Um, so the climate models suggest that in that world, we're probably going to warm by about a degree. Um, and, and I forget when it peaks, but maybe something like mid-century and then and then you know the the oceans and the and the trees start to and the land surface start to absorb a little bit, and then the temperature comes down. But we would peak at about a degree. I'm going to guess mid-century, but that might be wrong by a couple decades. Okay, that that's actually better than I had thought. Okay, well, I hope I'm not wrong. Thank you for your talk this evening and the research you're doing. It's uh, very important. I do a lot of energy policy work in the world toward renewable energy and am always packaging up messaging for policymakers and you know there, there's kind of a saying in the business that you got to package it up so a third grader can understand it and um, I think you also part of that is making it near-term impactful and, and so there's some challenges with you know as I'm listening to the science that you're working on to packaging it in a way that's going to get a policymaker to take some kind of useful action around it. And, uh, you know, I'm, my gears are going to how to do that to help you. Um, but also, I'm wondering if you have, you know, engaged in that process trying to influence policymakers. And, and if so, how, how has it gone so far? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. And I'm definitely all ears to any sort of <laughs> packaging advice that you have. So there's different types of policymakers. So they're, they're the the ones who come up for election pretty often who, like you say, have a pretty short sort of time frame, right? So these 2100 estimates are, are completely meaningless, right? They don't, they don't care on that time scale. So uh, our research does not, does not help them much, right? Um, I think our research speaks more to the policymakers, and there are some out there um, that are forced to think on sort of longer term time scales and are forced to make policy decisions today that depend on some assumption about what might happen in the future. Um, so that's a smaller set of policymakers, right? This is not going to be the mayor of Palo Alto or Menlo Park. This is, you know, probably not going to be our governor. This is, you know, although our governor has actually been very active on this. So that was a bad example. Um, it won't be lots of governors. Um, so we do speak to a smaller policy community, but I think there is a policy community out there for whom these uh, results are important. I was going to point out one more area that I'm not sure you included in your model, which was ocean acidification. As you increase the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it's absorbed into the ocean, it acidifies. And the crustaceans, et cetera, that the ocean ecosystem subsist on uh, become extinct because they can't have exoskeletons. Um, so it's something to consider, and I've heard several people mention stuff. So it comes to your point of positioning it. You may want to... Uh, position it as a, a subset of the factors. Otherwise, you may be quoted as a tool mm -hmm. saying you're only going to have yeah. this amount of economic impact yeah. um, because policymakers tend to twist what uh, scientists and economists say right. to whatever their agenda might be. Sure. No, that's a great point. So uh, as folks have brought up and as you just brought up, there are definitely lots of things that we don't include here. Everything that people have listed so far would make our results more negative. And I'm already worried that people aren't going to buy these results because they're pretty negative compared to what we already have, right? So, um, but, but, I, but I completely take your point. So I should have done a better job of acknowledging that. And the second thing that, that is important to acknowledge in all of this is 
is that studying climate change does not mean climate change is the most important thing for these outcomes, right? It's almost surely not the most important thing for, for, uh, for global conflict, right? We know many other things affect global conflict, uh, institutional quality, um, peacekeeping effort, all these other things. So none of what I showed you today should suggest that climate change is the most important thing, right? The whole point is just to try to quantify, okay, how big, how big a number is this? Is this something we should care about or not? Um, and what our estimates suggest is that it, it probably is something we should care about. But I think your point is that, that there are even more reasons to care, and, and that's exactly right. I think we want you to make the politicians as scared out of their wits as we are. I guess so, but fear is not always the best thing, right? Because sometimes people just shut off in, in, the, in, you know, in, in the face of fear. So I, I, I agree with you on some level, although I'm, I'm, I'm cautious. Okay, one more question. Okay, I'll try to make this short. <clears throat> I had a really interesting experience on the way just before I came over, I got a telephone call from somebody who was wanting to remodel my house. And I, thought, and I told him, no, I, I really am going to go listen to a lecture about climate change. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, you think that there is such a thing as climate change? <laughs> and I said, you know, the scientific evidence points in that direction, yes. And he said, are you a Democrat? <laughs> and, I, and I said... I said, I'm not going to get into that with you. <laughs> and then he hung up. But I thought, you know, and he said, well, before he finished up, he said, climate change is a giant scam to elect Democrats. And I thought, you know, I wanted to tell him, well, not all Democrats are smart. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to go that direction first, but I decided not to. So how would you respond to something like that? I mean... <laughs> yeah, no, that's a hard one. So my, uh, my father-in-law is, uh, or at least pretends to be, an ardent climate change denier, so I get to respond to this every Christmas. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't go well. Uh, <laughs> it, it's really hard. Like, it's, so, so some people, I think, have made up their minds and, and are very hard to dissuade. Uh, but what I'm hopeful about is over time you do see a slow but steady increase in the people who are starting to believe the science, right? And I think this can happen in different ways. It can happen through sort of improved education around the climate um, system, and so a lot of people are involved on that front. So, so educational programs in, in elementary schools even or high schools uh, to sort of just give people the basic science early on uh, and actually show that that, you know, that is a very strong predictor of people's beliefs about climate change later on. But to your plumber, uh, I, I think it's a really, it's a really hard thing. Uh, one analogy, and we were actually talking about this uh, bef at, at before I, I came up here, um, I think the insurance analogy works pretty well. So, you know, as long as there is some probability, I mean, if they completely deny the existence of climate change, completely deny it, then, then there's nowhere to start, right? But if, if people even buy that there might be a chance that things could change, right, then I, I think the sort of insurance analogy, well, you know, we, we buy insurance for sort of really bad, unlikely outcomes all the time. You know, climate change is, is not all that different than that. I mean, that, that's, that's one place that, that has worked a little bit for me in the past. But again, people have to, you have to be able to get your foot in the door just at least a little bit. If you can't do that, it's, it's, a, it's tough. You just hope they don't vote. Thanks.